today we're taking you to Radium Springs in Albany, Georgia. Um, and first, I just wanted to introduce you to a few of the people you might be hearing and some of those that were out with this. This is Steve Galladay. He has been an aquatic biologist at the Jones Center at Ichiwe in southwest Georgia since 1994. And the next few people you'll be seeing are also members of his lab. Um, this is Christine Fallon. She is currently a graduate student finishing up her master's uh, looking at food webs and intermittent streams, uh, particularly in relation to some smaller minnows and darters, such as the one she's holding there in the picture. And finally, this is me, Chelsea Smith. Uh, I'm currently a research associate at the Jones Center, but I also did my master's there uh, looking at macroinvertebrates and some of those same intermittent streams that Christine is working in. So... Today we wanted to start by um, going out to Radium Springs uh, to begin looking at what sort of fish and potentially mussels or macroinvertebrates might be living in the stream. And uh, just as a sort of beginning to this project um, in partnership with the Flint River Keeper. Radium Springs is located just south of downtown Albany. Georgia on the eastern side of the Flint River. It is one of 20 named springs that emerge from the upper Florida aquifer in the lower Flint River basin and it has the greatest discharge of those springs. It is also unusual for Flint River basin springs in that it has a spring run Skywater Creek that flows more than half a mile across the valley of the Flint River. Historically, during wet years, flow from Radium Springs has been measured at up to 100 million gallons per day, or 150 cubic feet per second. The spring is important in that it provides a thermal refuge and critical habitat for a host of species present in the biologically diverse Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, and Flint River Basin. We're, uh, we're in Radium Springs, which used to be called Skywater in Muscogee, which I can't pronounce. Uh, so that was the translation. And then when the Europeans rediscovered it, they changed the name to Blue Springs. And then in the late 1920s, when it became a resort, they found traces of radium uh, in the water, not enough to be a health issue, but at that time radium was considered exotic and there's a lot of different medicines and other things that were manufactured, machines with radioactive materials on them, so they named it Radium Springs, uh, and that's the name that's pretty much stuck uh, since the late 1920s. The Radium Springs Casino was completed in 1927. It rose above the spring with terrace stone walls and featured a cavernous dance hall and elegant dining room. A fire in 1982, followed by devastating floods in 1994 and 1998, damaged the casino beyond repair. The remaining structure was removed in 2003. Today, all that remains is a courtyard on the site of the casino, which features interpretive signs detailing the history of Radium Springs. The stonework surrounding the springs and pool is one of the most significant remaining architectural features of the site. So we started out uh, on the far side of the spring and uh... We decided just to go ahead and suit up and kind of make our way through this mucky hydrilla area to get out to the main uh, boil point to snorkel around. Um, it's a little tricky, but there is a nice little stream that comes out from the spring called Skywater Creek. Um, and once we made it out here, we saw a lot of interesting fish, a few macroinvertebrates, mostly amphipods and isopods, and then a few crayfish, which I'll show you today. Um, so basically for some of this it'll just be snorkeling videos that we took while we were out there.
in this first video you'll see there's some sunfish swimming around. Most of these are either bluegill or a hybrid of a bluegill and red-breasted sunfish as well as some largemouth bass. Um, so I took this video swimming through a channel that was in some of the hydrilla beds. It's pretty amazing how thick uh, this plant can get uh, in this area. Um, most of these small fish that you're seeing, actually almost all of the small fish that you're seeing in this clip are Natropus harperi or red-eyed chub and they are interesting, uh, an interesting little fish in that they are often found in areas with high groundwater input so we see them even uh, in some of our smaller streams that have uh, heavy groundwater seepage and So here's a close-up of the harper eye or red eye chub. Um, they're really pretty little fish. Uh, we stained some up so that the Flint River Keeper could get some nice pictures of them. But you can see where they have that really distinctive red line down their body through their eye, which is where they get their name. Um, and this is actually one of the focal species that Christine is working on for her masters. So some of those fish you were seeing in that were the largemouth bass uh, here in the center as well as some of those sunfish I mentioned earlier, the uh, bluegill hybrids as well as bluegill, um, and here's just some nice close-up pictures of them so you can see them in a little bit more detail. Um, so this is actually deeper down in the, the main spring area. We were trying to get down to see this spotted sucker that you can kind of see there in the middle. Um, there are there are a lot more fish obviously in this area, including some white crappie, and um, we think we saw some striped bass as well that tend to use these sorts of areas as well as smaller streams, springs in the the river for refugia when things start to heat up in the summer. Um, it's hard to see, but there's a little crayfish down in that hole. We tended to see uh, some in most of these little holes that were in the limestone. Um, just, just going into the spring run. Um, and we happened to catch a little bitty one by accident inside of this um, snail shell that uh, Christine brought over. Uh, it's a viviparis, uh, the Georgia mystery snail. Um, but we weren't sure what kind of crayfish they were. Uh, that one was pretty tiny and we couldn't get the others to come out uh, without harassing them too much. Um, so we finished up in this area at the main spring and before heading down farther in the spring run. Uh, we got a few good pictures of some damselflies that were hanging out along the edges. Um, and so this is farther down uh, where the spring run actually connects up to the main river. Uh, it's a nice little stretch to snorkel around in and it's actually where we have our gauging station set up for monitoring here. The population of Albany, Georgia expanded rapidly in the second half of the 20th century, increasing the demand for water. Industrial water demand within the spring shed increased markedly 
with the establishment of paper products facility in the 1970s. At about the same time, the adoption of seven or pivot irrigation technology greatly increased withdrawals from the upper Florida aquifer to use to support crop production. In 1981, following periods of below normal rainfall and increased withdrawals from the aquifer, radium springs ceased flowing for the first time in recorded history. Nowadays, spring discharge decreases dramatically during most growing seasons when the demand for water is great and during multi-year droughts, the spring ceases to flow entirely. This causes Radium Springs and Skywater Creek to become stagnant and unattractive, being degraded aquatic habitats, and represents a profound change from their historic role as a community, amenity, and recreation area. Over time, the ecological and cultural values of Radium Springs have been diminished by urban encroachment and regional water use. This has not gone unnoticed within the community and a group of stakeholders has joined together to begin the hydrologic restoration of Radium Springs. We call ourselves the Skywater Project and our group includes farmers, industry representatives, city managers, the Flint River Keeper and other technical experts. The initial focus of the project is improving water use efficiency and source switching or developing new sources of water that do not alter the spring. As aquatic scientists, we are contributing to the effort through our knowledge of the biota and through the development of a hydrologic monitoring network. Working together, we hope to restore the luster of this beautiful spring and contribute to green space development and environmental education in this urban setting.